tonight, after all these years, <laughs> I finally killed George E. That's right. I caught him in the parking lot taking a leap. I pinched his head clean off just as he was shaking the last few drops of piss off of his top. freaking bad. Wrestle me. Welcome everybody to Juice Pro Wrestling Podcast episode 200 and motherfucking 7 Scum Dog Lucha With us tonight we have a very fucking special guest. The one the only from beyond Venus beyond Jupiter and way the fuck past Uranus the one the only Techno Destructo! AKA Hunter Jackson. Techno! Hunter! How the fuck are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm ready to kill stuff. I'm so excited about uh, the end of this month. I'm going to be doing Lucha Baboom, and uh, which is a really incredibly cool show where they have a, like a burlesque dancer and then wrestling and then another burlesque dancer. When I say burlesque dancer, it's like a real theatrical, lots of costumes and stuff. It's not like, you know, lap dance, you know, spread eagle stuff. It's like, wow. this is like, really crazy like like for instance uh they'll cut off all the lights and then they'll have one girl dressed up like uh bat girl and the other girl dressed up like cat woman with flashlights you know and stuff and and mayhem ensues and they have like uh these crazy i've seen crazy people that do a strip completely on a pogo stick the whole time and uh weirdo oh. stuff like that i'll get really get jim Cornette going if you know what i mean <laughs> Dude, God. so that's so fucking awesome. And one of the reasons, like, I mean, obviously we're here um, is I somehow I just discovered several months back that you were fucking a wrestler and it blew my mind because, dude, it's, uh, you know, the metal aspect of Guar, whether you want to call it metal or performing arts. And I mean, that shit and wrestling go hand in hand. It's the same fucking thing. So I was blown away and I was like, I, I was so stoked that you got back to me and, uh, you know, agreed to do this. And Lucha Vavoom is one of those promotions that have been around for a little bit now. Um, they just, they got it all. The, much like a uh, promotion in Milwaukee, uh, Mondo Lucha, they do like the the burlesque shows, you know, the and obviously the Lucha Libre, which is a huge thing. And I've watched a bunch of your matches online, including the <laughs> there was the one with now canceled Joey Ryan, where... Not even the almighty techno destructo could <laughs> withstand the power of Joey's phallus. Yeah, it was pretty tough. I'll tell you, that was a tough <laughs> match. But dude, what blows me away is like, and then I, you know, I fresh off the, this is Guar documentary exclusive on shutter. Everybody could check it out. I got a subscription. Why don't you, you motherfuckers? Um, dude, I see you wearing a Santino brothers wrestling Academy t-shirt. Where does this fucking wrestling journey begin with you? Well, uh, I, I split from Guar like around 2000, 2003, sort of in that area. And I yeah. was living in Philadelphia. And that's when I first started to actually do for real wrestling. But over the years in Guar, what we would do, uh, we would write a show and we would have an album that goes with that show. There would be a bunch of characters. So mm -hmm. we would have like a plot line we would do on a nationwide tour. And then when that tour would be over, we would go, oh, we want to hit those same cities, but we don't want to do the same exact show again. 
And somebody, not me, even though I was anxious to jump on the idea, somebody came up with the idea, let's do a wrestling show, you know? So we would stretch ropes across the front of the stage and we had a referee and actually have fights on the stage, you know, during the show, we would have three or four different matches during the course of the show. And, uh, it was really fun. And, and so I had already been stunt fighting and stuff like that, like crazy and playing this character. So when I split from Guar, I got the opportunity to do wrestling and I was like, come on, let's do wrestling. Let's get, do techno destructo, you know, in the ring. And I actually got to one of the first matches I did in uh, Philadelphia was against this band called Bad Luck 13. And it was like a handicap match, but it was also a lumberjack match where you have the rest of the band is all outside the ring. And every time I got thrown out, they would beat me up and throw me back in again. And then I had somebody dressed up as Scrooge to Moon to sort of represent me on the outside, too. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was a super crazy match. And then shortly after that, I got an opportunity to move to L.A. And then when I got to L.A., I was looking through the weekly entertainment paper and I saw this show, Lucha Baboon. You know, wow, that sounds like fun. So I call him or I ordered a ticket and I get an email back. Is this Hunter Jackson from Richmond, Virginia? And I was like, what? Huh? You know, and it turns out that one of Guar's old managers is the person that runs Lucha Baboon. No shit. Yeah. And so she hooked me up with uh, these Mexican wrestler dudes to start training. And uh, none of them spoke English or anything. And uh, the guy was, he was called Shamu Jr. He was a really big, <laughs> heavy dude. And he was called Shamu Jr., who was the teacher of the, of the class. And I did that for a while. And uh, then I decided uh, uh, I didn't have time to devote to it, mm. to that, that I felt like it needed. So I felt like maybe I should concentrate on my artwork for a while, which I did. And then I met Sin Bodhi, who does freak show wrestling. Yeah. And I found out about this wedding that this band, the radioactive chicken heads that I was hanging out with, they were going to go and some of their members were going to get married in Las Vegas at a show that was going to have professional wrestling at the wedding. Mm. And I was like, wow, how, I want to be a part of that. You know, so that's where I met Sin Bodhi. And after I did some stuff at that show, I was like, man, I would love to do more wrestling and stuff. I would love to do another wrestling show with you sometime. And he goes, I would love for you to do 300 shows with me, you know. <laughs> and so he hooked me up with training, including Santino Brothers. I also trained at a, a school called Knox Pro, which is in uh, uh, North Hollywood. That one is run by Rikishi. And uh, that whole family, which Rock, The Rock is part of that family tree. And so is you. Yokozuna is part of that family tree. Yep. You know, so, and that was a really cool school. That's where I first started training in L.A. But then I later, um, uh, Sinbodi introduced me to Brian Kendrick, who teaches a really incredibly cool class at Santino Brothers School. And I'll tell you, if you if you're a young guy, and you really want to do wrestling, that's and you really take it seriously, you really, really, really want to do it. Uh, Santino Brothers and Brian Kendrick is a great place to go. I mean, there's pl tons of places all over the country where you can train with guys that used to be, you know, on this and that promotion and stuff. But man, that school was really good because it teaches you a class, a course with a beginning, you know a middle and an end and then the course is over and you can continue to train with them if you want to but a lot of people when you learn to train they'll go okay here give me your dues and you just show up and we'll do whatever i feel like that night you yeah. know and all and that's kind of ambiguous you can learn a lot that way but man this school was the shit and and uh, i'm really lucky and really grateful that, that i got that opportunity and I'll tell you, it was lucky. And, and a lot of doors have opened up to me because of war as well, you know? Oh, yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, like I said, dude, it's it's performing arts. And that was that. And <clears throat> I'll just be transparent with you, brother. I was never like the biggest war <laughs> fan. Um, I got into him kind of as a kid when, you know, obviously the Beavis and Butthead craze, like they're they're kind of really like launched you guys like into, you know, some of these areas of, of the country where nobody knew or had access to guar um 
And it just, it was always impressive to me that it wasn't so much really, in my opinion, about the music as it was. It was just, you guys were all like a collection of fucking artists, man. Like doing this shit and the music was what kind of brought you and your skill sets to the table, you know, like more, more so than the music. And I mean, I, I'll I, tell I, you in, in all honesty to, to, and I think the, that recent documentary, you sort of get that idea, you know, because for a long time, Brocky was really trying hard to make it seem like it all flowed out of him, you know, yeah. when really there's a big crew there. There's a big crew. And I'm, I was one of them, not like, you know, I can't even even say that, oh, well, I'm the original creator. I did a lot of it. I created the science fiction part of it. I've created a lot of the cool characters and stuff. But, man, it took a it took a village to create Guar for sure, man. Yeah. And it's that's what's so cool about it, because it's like, you know, like in you guys, <laughs> a lot of you mentioned in uh, in the documentary, you know, you guys got your bachelor's degree in art and you went to art school and when I was younger and like really into drawing and sculpting and stuff, I just remember hating art class. Cause it was like, first of all, it's a subjective grade. Anybody that does the project should get an A it's a fucking opinion. Right. Yeah. Like, and it, it, you know, I would draw like fucking Lobo or Venom or some shit and like, oh, well, that's not fucking art. That's not good. You know, draw this clay that. pot or some shit. Yeah. Like, Fuck you. You know, flowers like, with shadows. So I was very much, it, it kind of turned me against the industry. And that's what I felt I got out of the documentary from you guys. And it was very like, mm -hmm. therefore, afterwards, like this punk rock aesthetic of like, fuck you, we'll do our own shit our own way, which I got mad respect for, man. Yeah, it was a big deal for me in art school. I definitely ran into that same shit. And I would, I would, uh, the teachers didn't didn't want to see what I wanted to do. You know, they were like, Oh man, that sucks. That's not what we want to see. Nobody wants to see that. You know, that's what they keep kept telling me. And I was like, I felt really strongly inside that, man, I'm not unique. I know that there are lots of other people out there that love the same kind of weirdo shit as me, you know, that have, have been exposed to grew up on the same reading the same comic books you know, watching the same stupid ass cartoons on the three TV channels that were available when we were kids, you know, <laughs> yeah. so I know there are people out there that have the same hunger and desire as me. And one of the big foundations of Guar is that we all have this inner desire, this inner burning uh, survival instinct that makes us want to bite each other in the neck and rip each other's throats out, you know. <laughs> and so Guar is a real sort of uh, uh, cure for that, a way to calm that down, you know, like drinking the Camille tea or whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for sure. We interrupt this wonderful episode for a short word from our shoot sponsors. Check out Slowpoke Toys to see an ever-expanding collection of toys and collectibles. Treat yourself and get something for you. Need to get a gift for a special somebody, a buddy, a friend, a loved one, a co-worker? It doesn't matter. Visit SlowPokeToys.com, the manufacturer of toys and collectibles you never knew you needed. Um, cycling back to, uh, you know, training and everything, how was that for you? Because, I mean, like... Obviously, uh, the build of wrestlers are very different. I mean, and you see guys like now the recently returning like Bray Wyatt, who is, I think, just, you know, me and Bodie just love the guy. He's a mastermind creatively, but yeah. he's one of those guys that he's not a bodybuilder, but you see the videos. He, he puts in the time training, but he has a different build. Were you always like, were you into like back in the day? And I guess now somewhat you would kind of have to be, I would suspect, um, uh, just into like some sort of fitness and or training and if not like how did that blow your mind when you started training wrestling and hitting the ropes and getting that fucking skin torn off and taking the bumps <laughs> getting winded yeah, well well the thing is that uh yeah i am a super scrawny art bag and growing up in high school and stuff i might not have been the wimpiest kid in school but i was definitely in the top five you know and I got, I always got picked on and stuff. But when I started doing Guar, what ended up happening, I started to play Techno Destructo and I'm like under, I have to wear this huge heavy costume and fight on stage every night. And uh, early on, uh, we went on this Canadian tour 
And I was sort of lifting weights and trying to get stronger and stuff. And uh, we had gone through a long period over the winter where we didn't do any shows. We had done a bunch of Halloween and then we didn't do any. And then we went on a winter trip to Canada. And during that trip, <laughs> I yanked my shoulder out on yeah. like the beginning of the tour. And it was a week long tour. And I went ahead and I had to do the show every night anyway. You know, and so when I got home, my arm was so fucked up and I was like, never again. From now on, I, there was a gym near me that was like a Nautilus gym with all the equipment, you know, and all the pulleys and stuff. And uh, so I started, I got a membership there and started training. And then I just got hooked on it and I, the, the health benefits and all that stuff. And like as because basically when you're training like that, what you're doing is you're breaking your body down and then your body has to heal itself back. And it's going, oh, my God, I need to be stronger. So it builds you back stronger. So while that's happening, it's healing all these other little problems that are going on in your body. So it makes you overall way more healthier and everything. And I just got hooked on it. And then after I. You know, in, in more recent years, when I've been wrestling and stuff, I never know when somebody's going to call me and say, hey, guess what? I've got a chance for you to do something cool, This, but it's got to be this weekend, you know, so I've got to be ready, you know. Yeah. So I train like crazy all the time. And uh, it was it was really fun. This last uh, last year or so, I went back with Guar for the first time. I'd split with them in like yeah. 2000, like I was saying. For the and 30th anniversary, right? 30th anniversary tour. And I was like, those dudes are getting so old, man. What are they <laughs> going to be too late? And I'm, you know, I better, I better go back and do it some more before it's yeah. too late. So I went back and man, it was just so much fun to bring all of the cool shit I had learned doing wrestling and stuff to the stage. Yes. And uh, it, it was a really fun tour. And I'm, I'm hoping I can do another one too. I really That's am that's awesome about the wrestling and um the stage show because i used to wrestle too and uh, i do vocals in my band and i take what i learned there and i apply it for it i even wear a lucha mask on stage but it goes hand in hand wrestling and metal metal shows you know stuff like that so bringing the art to life and wrestling you're bringing the art to life on stage too yeah it's it's fun and uh now to get the like uh liz I had sort of like slacked off and like my, I was getting scrawny and, and uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do wrestling anymore, you know? And all of a sudden Liz called me and said, after she had seen the documentary and stuff, I mean, look at that. Let me see those. Let's see your fucking, you got <laughs> the pump. Pop that too. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Fuck yeah, dude. Nice. But she like called me and she's like, uh, you know, she wanted me to do Lucha Boom, And I was like, you know, I don't really feel confident about it. It's been so long since I've been training and stuff. And so she hooked me up with little Cholo who works for Lucha Boom, And uh, I've been training with them for like a month and a half now. And oh man, I've been having so much fun. And, and uh, it's really fun to learn, to relearn Lucha style and uh, stuff like that. So I'll tell you, man, usually when people, uh, I tell people, oh, I'm going to do a show in Florida or I'm going to do a show here or there. And they're like, oh, man, I'm going to get a plane ticket and go see it. And I'm like, oh, man, you know, I hate to admit it, but it probably really isn't worth it, you know, to like get a plane <laughs> ticket and like fly across the country. But in this situation, this show, this show is going to be so fucking off the hook that I would say, yeah, if you want to see Techno Destructo at its best ever this is going to be the show. I'm going to have my favorite uh, mysterious space dominatrix, uh, Princess <laughs> yeah. Paramorg, is, who is, if uh, to tell you who she is, she's the one. She's on the uh, Easter egg, preparing for the Easter egg hunt of death video on uh, my YouTube. The It's House of Huntar YouTube page. And I have a House of Huntar with an A, H-U-N-T-A-R, uh, dot com i have a uh uh web page too where you can see tons of stuff about guar it also has uh some of my uh freelance artwork i've done for people and it's got a lot of wrestling stuff and links to wrestling videos too we're, awesome. yeah, we're gonna have all links to all your shit in the description so everybody can check that out but you're yep. speaking of you know art for people i just seen you did uh some art for belushi speedball the band yeah <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, that was fun. And I'll tell and here I've got another They're at full this one out. The, the, in fact, you're seeing this before the guy who paid for it. Can you see it or is it oh, too much oh, yeah. Pull it up a little more. Like like more closer to oh there we go. There. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So this That's is awesome. for this is for like a podcast uh uh type of a show called uh Bad Radio Live Behind the Schemes, you know. So yeah, if you want me to do art uh freelance art, I'm I'm available, you know. So already t shirt already designs and, <laughs> right. and all kinds of shit. Awesome. In okay. fact, when I went to the sh I went to the Guar show just last night, they were happen to be here in LA. And I went just last night and I was checking out the t-shirt booth and I was like, wow, you know, they're still using my old ass logos from like a million years ago. <laughs> you know, Dude, of course they got to it's over 30 years now, you know, yeah. co-creator. They fucking, why wouldn't they? You know? Exactly. But I'll tell you something else. Uh, if fans want to see, like they just put out this super cool comic book, you know, that's really awesome. And uh, I was really impressed with the great job they did it on, with it because the last couple of graphic novels they did were kind of like, eh, you know, but this one is really good and it's worth checking out. And uh, uh, they gave me a copy, but I don't see it nearby. But anyway, uh, yeah, so if fans want to see more Hunter Jackson Guar art, you know, uh, let Guar know that you want to see that, you know. Have you ever the Build a fire under their foot, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> yes. Fuck yeah. Have you ever done uh been approached or had any interest to do anything for I don't know, like in like image comics or Marvel or DC or any of those guys? Well, when we were first doing Guar to promote Guar, uh one of the things that I was really into was going to comic book conventions a lot. And uh I would push uh trying to get Guar comics and trying to get my own comics too. But yeah, yeah. at the time, they were always like, all the publishers were like looking at my stuff and going, uh, oh, it looks too underground. You know, they weren't so into it. But I mean, over the years, my style has evolved. And here, here's something I've got. <clears throat> I just recently put this book out. Da -da -da. This was called When Heroes Roam the Earth. And this is a 48-page nice. graphic novel that a lot of this stuff I published in the Guar comics and stuff. Yeah. But I recolored it all and just put it out like about a year ago, maybe. You can get it on my website and stuff. But uh, it's a, a post-apocalyptic superhero story about this uh, superhero chick named Lady Liberty who runs around in a skimpy costume beating up robots with her bare hands. So <laughs> yeah, bare breasts. It's uh, really fun. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Fuck so yeah, that's man. what I do. <laughs> Dude, and that's great. I mean, because that's what we're all huge fans. A lot of our listeners are huge fans of, oh, yeah. you know, this is like, and it's so super cool to talk to you about this stuff. Um, what's kind of like you, young Hunter Jackson, growing up, huge comic fan, sci-fi, horror. What's some of the shit that got your rocks off, man, as a young kid that kind of influenced you? Well, when I was really little, the Herculoids came out when I was about six years old. Her Herculoids and Space Ghost and all that. <laughs> yes, Space Ghost Space the shit. and man i was like super into all those all those tv shows and stuff and then as uh i remember the first time i was old enough to that my mom gave me some uh birthday money i bought comic books with it because up until that point i had always been forbidden to have comic books so after that it was all over plus <laughs> at that time like around 65 or so that's when that cartoon show the marvel had that cartoon show that was on in the afternoon was that the you know? super was, friends no not super was, friends. or spidey and his amazing friends no that was a little bit later too this was like the marvel heroes the hulk captain america iron man oh yeah yeah, yeah yeah you've seen them it's that real crude animation where a lot yeah. of times they just cut the pictures out of the comic book and have them go <laughs> you know, across <laughs> <Yeah>. the stage <laughs> you know which, I mean, when you're doing that to Jack Kirby artwork, all of a sudden, boom, it's already better than everything else. Right, right. right exactly. at the time, Jack was the fucking man. Yeah, and I definitely, even though over the years I forgot, you know, those stories and stuff, I remembered that, you know, they really stuck out in my mind and really helped me form all this stuff. But then later when I got into high school and stuff, I, I was like, I grew up out in the sticks, <laughs> away from the city. 
and I was always dying to get somewhere where I could buy comic books and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I knew there was a whole world out there that I w- didn't have access to and I was really hungry for. So later on, when I got to be high school age and stuff, I would seek out Japanese comic books. And this was before any of them had ever been translated into English, you know. And every once in a while, you would get a really fuzzy VHS tape, you know, that was a couple of generations of some giant robot shit or something like that. <laughs> Another thing I was really into was the the Power Rangers, you know, yeah, yeah. before they came out over here. Right. I would like collect that shit like crazy. And then when I when it turned out that, oh, my God, this stuff is for like like, uh, you know, first graders, you know, <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? You know, when they actually translated it and it was on TV. I was like, what? What did they do to one of my favorite things? You know, because I always thought the monsters were so cool, you know, and I would collect the books and stuff. And but I'll tell you, one of the things that influenced Guar more than anything else was the British comics, the 2000 AD. AD, like Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd and all those. So I I had a subscription to 2000 AD and I also had a, a subscription to Jump. And that came out every week. So between Mm. those two things, I was like, wow, you know, there's there's a huge world of crazy shit out there. That's not just Marvel Comics. You know, there's more out there than just that. Yeah, definitely. Did you ever get into any of the EC comics? Not so much EC, but uh, those were probably, I think, dead and gone by the time you were. I was into it. I was into those a little bit. That they were coming out in the black and white, like Eerie and Vampirella and all that. Those oh, books were out yeah. at that time, but they were kind of above my age level, you know, mm. when they were out on the stands. But uh, um, one thing I did get into is uh, in high school when I was first really collecting comics and I found out that, oh man, there's a comic book shop. There's a shop in Richmond that only sells comic books. Who ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> Tell me you didn't yeah. fucking live there, dude, because I know as a kid, I was, dude, I, I was a riddling kid. I was selling my riddling to go buy comics. <laughs> 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 I was like, this oh, guy. they caught me like, all right, Mr. Drug Dealer. I'm like, I, I'm not, I just want to buy comics. I didn't do nothing. He had a, his store was exactly like what you're talking about, where kids were always in there all the time. It was always full of kids. But he goes one day, he goes, hey, I've got this box of underground comics that I don't even want to have in my store. I want to get rid of it somehow as quick as I can. I don't even want to look at it here. Give me 40 bucks and I'll give you this whole box. You know, and I was like, I was a 16 year old hunter. (laughs) I'll be right back. You know, and I bought that box of underground comics and my head just went. (laughs) And it was like full of Robert Crumb and uh, Mm. uh, Vaughn Bodie with Cheech Wizard and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, this is the shit. I was like, this is what I want to do. You know, these comic books are so funnier. And so (laughs) awesome, you know, and uh, this is the kind of shit that I want to do. And so in a big way, what we were doing and uh, Chuck Varga, who played this executioner, he was on the same page as me with all this shit at the same time. And so what we wanted to do is bring a Robert Crumb comic book to life on stage, Yeah, you know, and at the same time, I wanted to have like Jack Kirby, giant robots beating each other up you know jack kirby slash japanese giant robots beating each other up on stage at the same time you know and then you bring don draculich in the mix who what his deal was he wanted to see people get their heads chopped off and (laughs) 15 feet into the audience so once you get all those uh different chemicals in the mix it's like (laughs) you know and and guar is born didn't don did don play techno a couple he of times, did, but you know, not very well, I might add. But he did. <laughs> it was like, uh, I don't know. There was always a weird relationship with me and Don, where uh, I would do all this crazy shit, and then uh, he would like mock whatever it was I was doing. Oh, that hunter, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Ah, you know, and he would he would put down whatever it was I was working on, and then as soon as I had moved on to another project. 
he would pick up that project that he was just making fun of how stupid it was and he would make his version of it you know and for me I was, I didn't, and then he would say, see, look how much better I am than Hunter. I took his idea and made it my way, you know, and I'm like, you know, dude, why couldn't we have just collaborated from the start, you know, and made something cool from the beginning. Yeah. And and then Brocky, on the other hand, he was the musician. He was the leader of the musicians. So Mm -hmm. he would play up those rivalries between the artists to keep the artists working, you know, against each other. So that, you know, so that, and it, and that's what Guar was like. And that's why one of the quotes that I always say when I talk about Guar mm. is that being in Guar is like being on the world's greatest basketball team, you know, but 97 can, Chicago Bulls, you can never make it to the playoffs because your own teammates are always blocking your shots and stealing the ball <laughs> just as you're about to score. Score on the day, other side. Modern day Lakers. <laughs> You know, and uh, anybody who's played, you know, street ball knows what I'm talking about, you know? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so that's kind of what it was. It was like a whole pack of alpha dogs. Yeah. But I mean, it's such a weird thing, because when you talk about like you said, why don't we just collab? Right. Instead of like, dude, being a jackass and saying, well, look, I did it better. Okay, but you didn't come up with the fucking idea. How much more awesome is that? Say you take that to your boss or, you know, you're working for a publication company, you're putting out comic books or whatever, any kind of visual medium. Um, and you're like, hey, man, we did this. Like, check it out. It's probably and they're like, yeah, fuck. Yeah, this is awesome. As opposed to like, I know if I was running a fucking a business and I had somebody come up to me like that, like I, I would know right away, like get the fuck out of here. Like if you guys can't get along. You know, because that it hinders, like you're saying, it just hinders the productivity of everything, not to mention up here, setting people like, yeah, that's fun and games, Dave, Brocky, Mr. Fucking, hey, let's pin them against each other. But at the same time, you're creating animosity. It's like any shoot job anybody has, any nine to five, you have people there. You think, yeah, I think I'm the best salesman at my fucking job and this dude's a snake or vice versa. Like, instead of just coming together and kicking ass, like. That's the shit that fucking bothers me, man. We interrupt this wonderful episode for a short word from our shoot sponsors. Check out Slowpoke Toys to see an ever-expanding collection of toys and collectibles. Treat yourself and get something for you. Need to get a gift for a special somebody, a buddy, a friend, a loved one, a coworker? It doesn't matter. Visit SlowpokeToys.com, the manufacturer of toys and collectibles you never knew you needed. Was there a lot of tension like that within Guar? Oh my God. It was like, it was the worst. And you know, the bottom line of it is I'm not there anymore. You know, I, I would rather. And and that was one of the things that I was kind of bummed about the, the documentary is yeah. because he did, he shot a lot of stuff with me. He shot a, a, like about four hours of, you know, interviews with me, you know, and what I was expecting to see, was me roller skating around in the art gallery going, I'm free, you know, because that's how I feel about war to me, even though I did a lot of cool shit. And I'll tell you, I'm fiercely proud of everything I did and everything I accomplished with war because there were so many people trying to keep it from happening. You know, it's like, Oh my God, Hunter is going to do this thing that I can't take credit for. This must be stopped, you know? And, uh, Shit like that. There was so much of that going on that to me, Guar in a big way just represents artistic oppression. And so now that I'm I'm free of those guys, I'm three thousand miles away from them. You know, I feel released. Like I love wrestling so much because you know it's about uh, like when you get in the ring and you fight with each other. You know, every look. Hey, I hate to tell you this. We were Don't really s- on the same side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was gonna say, don't drop thing. any f bombs. We don't use f bombs on this show, <laughs> and I'm not talking about fuck. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, and believe me, my character as the wrestler that I am, I push that envelope to the to the extreme. <laughs> I'm I'm always pushing the envelope of believability for sure. You know, like one of the things I do in the show. Let me see if I can bring it over here without causing an avalanche. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everybody would love to see some fucking 
Destructor. Oh, from the Destructor himself. Oh, shit. Oh, hell yeah. So one of the things I use in my show is this, which is a <laughs> dummy of myself, right? <laughs> and I'll, I'll hide this somewhere. I'll hide it like under the ring or around the corner or behind a curtain. And then I'm like getting my ass kicked and I'll powder out. And my tag team partner will have me by the tail going, no, come back, come back. And I'll go under the ring or whatever. And they'll pull that thing out and swing it around <laughs> and, and use it as a weapon. And like yes. knock people out and then throw it back behind the, the curtain. And I'll come out like, <laughs> yeah, it's genius. I love it. It's really fun. And, you know, the funny thing about it is it happens so fast. Yeah. That at first, the audience is like, huh? what's going on? And by the time they realize what's going on and they start laughing, it's over, you know, yeah. and I'm coming out and they like, or la it's, it's really fun. It's really, well, dude, fun. Love and that's like the that. great. Yeah. It's the great thing about professional wrestling. And it, it's gotta be a fucking riot for you because you're a fucking artist, dude. You're so creative, you know, on, on many different mediums, dude. And professional wrestling is the perfect fucking landscape and the perfect transition. So it's like, yes. yeah, you had some that you were a part of, you helped create and uh, make like a worldwide thing. And you're, you're speaking about that freedom. Like you're, you're away from that, but without it, it's like, it's afforded you this opportunity now, like in, in, in pro wrestling and that dude, that's just so awesome. Like that whole creative process that you just said with that little spot right there, does that blow your mind? Like how going into every match, how are you? Is that like the most strenuous part of uh, mentally? How do I word this? Being able to be prepared for a match, like just thinking about, man, there's so much shit I could do with this guy and like, blah, 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 as opposed to just, you know, the physical in ring shit. Well, I try to, I have a big arsenal and the long, the more I do it, the, the bigger my bag of tricks gets, you know, but I try to limit it because I don't want to overwhelm the audience with too much weird shit, you know, dude, the wrestling fans, brother, they are the weirdest <laughs> of all the weird right? shit. Yeah. But I also, I also have my, uh, uh, robot. I have like a robot referee yes. that I bring in sometimes, you know, and, uh, what about uh, your brothers? Where's techno's brothers at? Are we going to see trios sometime? I don't know. I'd have to get coordinated with them. And I'll tell you what, a lot of what I do, it, it took me a lot of training, like with no stuff on, like with the Lucha training I'm doing now, I don't even take my junk to, to training. I just do it regular. I'm learning everything just like everybody else and all. And during my matches, a lot of, uh, a lot of times what will happen is I'll get all my shit torn off of me. And then while I'm all naked, then I do the real wrestling stuff, you know? Yeah. And, awesome. Uh, uh, like that. So you really, it really takes a lot of training to be safe, do it safe for you, yep. yourself well, and other people. That's yeah. That's the main, the main thing in professional wrestling, man. You're yeah. a good wrestler. If you and your opponent, you know, you're, it's your job to take care of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we know what yeah. wrestling is and you know, unfortunately there has been in wrestling's history, a lot of people that go into business for themselves yep. and you fucking got to be able to trust who you're working with in the ring. You're if you don't trust who you're working life, with, dude. yeah. If you don't trust who you're working with, you're not going to make the magic happen. Yeah, yeah, that can be weird and scary too. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, because you're sudden you're working with somebody that doesn't give a shit if they hurt you or not. Yeah, right. Putting well, your how, shine on them. How scary <laughs> is it though? Too like, I mean, what what is the contrast between the it's because there's it's definitely there. I mean, how much is your uh, your gimmick weigh? How much is your suit? Uh, about ninety pounds. All together okay the so still itself is about half of that and then trying to maintain the speed now you're weighted down with 100 pounds and especially in lucha libre where you're doing you know hurla canranas and all this crazy stuff like or at least attempting to what is that like for you with you know the whole gimmick on because that's i'm watching these matches on youtube brother and i'm looking i'm like damn man and it's cool don't get me wrong because like the fucking huge claw the wrench squeeze the motherfuckers and put yes. them in leg locks and everybody's selling dude i'm like love it this is awesome i need tony khan if you're out there watching and listening we need this shit in aew man yeah, crossover no crossover well I'll, I'll tell you uh 
if there are other wrestling promoters out there, I'm available and I'm I'm ready to do stuff. It's the the catch to it is the plane ticket. You yeah. know, that's the hard part, especially right now. Plane yeah. tickets are like crazy high. Mm-hmm. And I have all my gear and it's in two giant hockey bags. And believe me, carrying those two things around is harder than anything I have ever done in the wrestling ring. I'll tell yeah. you. Forcing yeah. those things around at the airport. Oh my God. Jeez. Oh, you ever lost and, any? Uh, no, I've never lost them. I've almost like killed myself, to, you know. <laughs> oh man. Be, just because they're so fucking heavy and I'm trying to carry them around and it's like a hundred degrees in LA or whatever, you know. Oh. But uh and getting them home again, that's mm. the hardest part. Like when I get off the trip from the airport to my house, you know, on the bus and all that kind of shit, you know. It's kind of out there, but you know, that's part of the fun of it. And then it's ordeals like that <laughs> where the gods are just testing you to see if you're worthy of their gifts. So, <laughs> <there you go. laughs> Hell yeah, dude, it's just, it, it, it's so crazy, it's man. Problem. Like I said, uh, that the fact that you're all that gear, man, that you're doing it in the ring and, and it's great, man. I just like everything that it presents and what you're able to set up with your opponent, man. It's it's highly it really, entertaining. It really changed the dynamics of it because a lot of times I'll plan out what we're going to do. And then when we get in the ring and start moving around, it's like, oh, man, I've got this big rectangular block on my back. And I'm, <laughs> you know, but so uh, did it, you- it, that's part of the fun of it. You know, that the audience can see that I'm really struggling under the weight of it, you know, and that just makes it even funnier. did you watch much i mean dude you're a richmond guy like i there was a lot of wrestling in the old school days the territory days going on what what were you involved in any of it as far as like fandom did did you oh dude yeah because see come on you know when i was growing up just like i was saying earlier there were only three channels on tv so a lot of times on saturday or sunday wrestling was the only thing that was You know, wrestling, bowling, golf, you know, that's your three choices, you know. So uh, I sort of started watching it, you know, and I remember, man, seeing. uh, I remember when Dusty Rhodes broke Ric Flair's arm, you know, they follow him to go pick up his paycheck. Flair, Flair and the horseman broke Dusty's arm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I saw that on TV when it happened and I was like, what? Are you kidding me? You know? (laughs) They did that. They're showing it on TV and and like the cops aren't like knocking on their door, getting ready to take them <laughs> away, you know. And at that moment, I like, wow, wrestling is like super fucking awesome. And that's when I started like wanting to watch it all the time, you know. And then uh, there were these two wrestlers called there was one called the Blue Avenger and the Super Destroyer. And they both wore masks. So to me, that was like superheroes. Yeah, cool. You yeah. know. And then I found out that, oh, my old man will actually take me to a wrestling show. Awesome. Because he was always too busy to do anything. But he'll take me to go see wrestling. Cool. You know, so he and I would go see wrestling. And the first wrestling match that we went to, uh, there was also Ivan Koloff was there. Oh, shit. Yeah. The Russian dude. Yeah. And he was fighting against. Jim, uh, Boogie Woogie Jimmy Valiant, who's like yes. the guy with the big <laughs> hair, you know, oh, yeah. he had this big Santa Claus beard, and he would like shake his head around, and he had this boom box on his shoulder, and he would play that Manhattan transfer song about the boy from New York City, you know, all the time that would be on the PA, and he would be dancing around with the boom box on his shoulder. <laughs> and at the time, Ivan Koloff wasn't doing the Russian thing, he was doing the devil. He had this red, like Dracula cape and uh, he had a shovel, you know, so he was supposed to be like the devil, you know, and he comes running into the ring, slides right into the ring, grabs that boom box off of his shoulder and just smashes it over his head into a million pieces that cascaded all over the ring. It was probably full of glitter and stuff. You know? <laughs> And me as a little kid, and then Jimmy Bo- Jimmy Valiant just laid out spread eagle on the ring unconscious. And then they rang the bell for the ring to start, or, or <laughs> rang, the, rang the bell for the match to start, you know? And I was like, at that moment, I was like, oh, my God, 
this is the coolest fucking thing in the universe. And I became Ivan Koloff became my favorite wrestler ever. And then he started doing the Russian thing. And it just so happened that the Richmond Coliseum, where they did the wrestling shows, was 10 blocks away from the slave pit where we created Guar. And that meant wow. that nobody had to drive. So we could get totally shit faced and walk <laughs> over there yes. and go see the wrestling show without having to worry about getting busted for drunk driving. So, oh man, we used to go over there and raise hell. And my girlfriend made these shirts for us that were like just red t-shirt with a hammer and sickle like on them, you know, and then we would take a plastic chain because the Russians would always do the Russian chain match, yep. you know? And all, and I would get like six tickets and then sell them to whoever would go with us, you know, and we'd all have six people in the red shirts with the chain and hold it <laughs> up and cheer for them, you know. Oh, man, it was so much fun. And this was in the Ronald Reagan Cold War years. too. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, man, it was so much fun. So, yeah. Oh, and, you know, that was the whole guar. Uh, a lot of the guar dudes would go to those shows with me, like Sex Executioner really? always went. Yeah. Did, uh, so, uh, fast forward a little bit, um, you know, you guys are doing Guar and all that shit. Did you keep up with like the boom of wrestling in the nineties? I mean, cause I dude, it was ECW, WCW, WWF. Some yeah, say it's the era. greatest era, you know, I mean, the that's you had the seventies well, and eighties. I'll tell you one thing for sure. When I was a kid or when I was, uh, uh, like college age and we were really into this wrestling stuff like when I was in my 20s hmm. uh, there were two distinct styles of wrestling for us one was the real redneck wrestling which we super loved and the other one was that super fake Hulk Hogan bullshit that we hated you know those were the two kind of wrestling that there were there was the real shit like rick flair and the four horsemen and there was the bullshit wrestling you know like roddy pipe well not so much roddy piper he was one of the cool you watch that tongue if you <laughs> like this <laughs> job i'm talking about hulk hogan and and uh, all those dudes you know that when he and the other thing was that we could see happening was that he was destroying all the small wrestling, you know, territories yeah. was swallowing him and Vince. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was buying all the talent out and he was, uh, punishing the people that wouldn't not feel strongly that that's one of the reasons why Ivan Koloff has never made it into the hall of fame, you know, because he stood up to Vince McMahon. Ivan had, is Ivan's not in there. In he, WWE? No, he's not. He eventually went good guy. He went good guy and went to WWE or WWF, whatever it was. And uh, he eventually went over there. But just like Dusty Rhodes, you know, Dusty Rhodes was mouthing off like, I don't care if you put yellow polka dots on me. I'm still going to kick ass. So Vince was like, oh, yeah, OK, we'll do that. You know, yeah, Vince, and then they Vince stuck was him with that the bag asshole. Lady. They stuck him with the bag lady for a ballet. Yep. Oh, man. Oh, uh, uh, what was her name? Uh, Sherry, uh, wasn't it? No, it no. was um, it was Chucky Black or girl. something like that. It was like sweetness or some or God damn it. Oh man. Whatever. I hey what man, I, I took a couple of oneies on this show. I've drank some uh Yingling Oktoberfest. It's delicious. I can't remember everything. That's on you guys. Leave it in the comments, you pieces of skiz. That's <laughs> gonna bother me. People. It's gonna fucking bother me now. <laughs> it's so uh, Dusty Rhodes, though, huge, huge fan growing up, right? Have you kept up with like what happened? What's going on with like Cody Rhodes nowadays in like the last five years? Well, actually, what happened was I, I store once the Stone Cold Steve Austin came out, you yeah. know, and started playing the working class guy beating on the boss that it. That attracted me back into it. And it then China, everybody, brother. That's why they won the once war. Once I saw China, man, I was, I thought China was the shit, man. I, I fucking recorded everything she ever did, man. I got a China pop in my living room right now. There you go. I thought, don't China treat me like a woman. Shit. Don't treat me like a man. <laughs> man. Don't treat me like a woman. <laughs> Don't and treat then, me like a man. And then she hurt her neck and wouldn't back off, you know, that, that kind of. Bum, all know. those up and downs on hunter you know 
You never know. I bet. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, I feel like that would build up some, uh, you know, strength or something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, man. She was awesome. That's what sort of brought me back into it where I started to follow it again. So you I, didn't, you didn't fuck with NWO or WCW back then when they were doing that? Some, yeah, I was having a hard time. I was having a hard time deciding which one to watch. And usually right. it was whichever one had the hottest girls on it to be awesome. I mean, to be honest, well, you know, yeah. a lot of it was the girls. And, you know, that's one of the things that I'm the most bummed about, about what Squar is doing now is there's not a female character. In it. So it's like a big, you know, sausage party. <laughs> <laughs> there well, used to be well, one that would join. But what eventually happened was, was they uh, they changed the way that you watch wrestling. So now you have to fucking subscribe and pay for shit. So fuck that, you know. I can. There's enough shit I can watch on TV yeah. for free. Yeah, <laughs> sure. For, for the most part, there is like, and what's crazy, and now like what you're much a part of is the territories have returned, but they've returned as like independent promotions that are sprinkled yeah. all throughout the. You know, geographical United States of motherfucking America. You know, we're in Chicago. Well, I'm in Chicago land. Bodie's down in Florida now. But dude, Chicago land, we're in Mecca. We get AEW coming here all the time. Yeah, you're WWEs, but there's like five or six different major independent promotions that are either running like high spots wrestling network, independent mm-hmm. wrestling TV, fight, fight. Which shout out to fight, you guys fucking rule. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been on that before. I haven't yeah. seen it. I haven't seen it, but I've been on that before. Oh man, we can we can get you hooked up with that, brother. That's no problem. But there's <laughs> there's so much shit. It is the return of like territories, you know, like and what you're a part of that California connection, the LA connection, you know, there's uh so Lucha Vavoom. Uh now what was PWG? That was what? Was that Reseda or something or not Reseda? Oh, Wrestling Gorilla. Yeah. But anyway, we'll just talk California in general. You know, PCW Ultra. Oh, Northern California, yeah. PWG. Joseph Samael, you know, like. Hood Slam is super awesome, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hood dude. Slam, yeah. There's so much shit. There's a lot that, fuck, man, I can't even mention. But that's what's cool. Like, and especially a guy like you, do your older cap. But, man, you have this notoriety. And here's the thing about wrestling. Whether you're fucking the most physically gifted technician in the motherfucking ring or the most entertaining on this motherfucking stick, which I am. <laughs> you got to put asses in seats. You got to. That's where you have, in my opinion, a leg up on everybody. You have this association with a fucking huge metal outfit that has been a big band for the last 30 plus years now. Mm-hmm. You know, like. You're in a way it's like you're Charlotte Flair and Rick Flair's your dad. There's your fucking rub right there <laughs> because the crossover dude, like good on you for that because you're fortunate. If this was 10 years ago and you were doing this shit as like, well, you know, there wasn't a lot of indie promotions around. And if there were, it's like you're, you're seeing them at the worst VFW halls and it's all these out of shape lunch fucking ladies and you know, like whatever, like drunks from the bar. It wasn't yeah. like it is now where the talent pool and these independent scene is just nuts. You have every variety of professional wrestler from top mm-hmm. to fucking bottom. You know, I, if you were to do it 10 plus years ago, I'd be like, man, well, good luck. You know, as long as you like to do it, I love wrestling, but there's not enough places to work. And now, <clears throat> excuse me, to actually make money on the independent scene, which once again, let's tap it. What does Hunter Jackson do? Hunter Jackson produces fucking artwork you know you got so much merch and shit you're way ahead of the game brother there's no reason you should fail at this you know what i mean (laughs) yeah but you know this is professional wrestling is a real um fans suck i'll be honest and we're fans but we're we're the fucking cool guys that you like to listen to hit like and subscribe bitches it's a big uh don't quit your day job kind of thing you know totally and and uh over the years, that's one thing that has allowed me, and that's something that I want to bring to everybody out there. You know, if you want to, if, if you're thinking, oh, man, I wish I could be like Hunter Jackson. He gets to do all this cool shit, you know. Call these you know what? I still have plans. my day job, and that's one of the things that enables me to do what I want. But well, what is your day job? What's your shoot job? Well, I make, uh, I work at a shop where I make artificial limbs for amputees. 
and and work on leg braces for crippled people and stuff like that. So I, I I've learned a lot about materials and working with things, and I bring that into my art. You know, awesome. So in fact, I doubt there would be even be a guar if it wasn't for certain key things that I learned about. Uh, how to make things by doing artificial limbs and junk. So like you've that. been doing that. Yeah. That's been your shoots ever since back uh, in the day. Uh, well, I started. Uh, I was a prison guard for a really long time. Fuck like that my, shit. my dad was the <laughs> warden of a big prison, and oh, so shit. I kind of like grew up in this on this little hill that was surrounded by a giant prison. You know, but uh, and that's why that's why I was always into comic books and watching too much TV and stuff. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of ki- other kids around. But anyway, so I, once I got of age, I started to, I got my first jobs were like working at the prison, you know, and I would be a guard or whatever. And, and I did that for about eight years until my girlfriend said, hey, this is turning you into a bad person. You need to quit. And luckily, uh, I actually did. And then eventually I started doing artificial work in a, at a shop. You know, it was a shop near where we we we're doing the slave pit and we used to dumpster yeah. dive all the time and saw what they were working on. And one day I went in I heard they were looking for workers. So I went in and, and they hired me, you know, and uh, it's such a cool job. And I was so into it and into learning it and all that it's always been my, day, you know, fallback day job. And it know? fits so perfectly. It just slides right into the tight, wet it vaginal crevasse it of does. your artwork, you know, like, and creating that's what the fuck you know i need <laughs> hands on learning how to make and use some of the best materials and shit you know yeah yeah for real and so uh it, it all works together all, all the pieces fit together but you know you've got to be stable and there's uh, you know i'll tell you one thing that uh is really that you really need to know about professional wrestling if you want to really do it is there's a fucking really high suicide rate you know especially a few years ago when uh the WWE was your only, the only game in town, you know, and like Sin Bodhi, who was my mentor, he, uh, he ended up uh, getting the rug jerked out from under him. You know, he had dedicated his whole career to being a professional wrestler. And all of a sudden he's banned. Vince McMahon got pissed off at him about stuff we don't need to go into. That really didn't have anything to do with him. Then he's not guilty of it. So, you know, he, he lost his, his, uh, whole career that he was banking on and there's he was one he kazarni or something yeah he he came out as kazarni yeah he's contemporary with uh one of the two guys oh man fuck i hate being fucking 60 i can't remember their fucking name (laughs) i just (laughs) turned 40 holler at a place as in christian as in christian oh okay so he's from all those guys are from canada yeah yeah, they all like train together and stuff and uh he was one of the undertaker's acolytes too in his really early, early training days, you know, and uh, what happened was Edge did something and got in trouble. And they, since he was so much money, they couldn't punish him. So they go, okay, we'll punish your best friend. You yeah. I, I, yeah. I remember the story now. Now that you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. So then Sin Bodhi went off and did his own thing. And I'll tell you, you guys were talking about Gray Wyatt earlier, you know, a lot, a large percentage of Gray Wyatt's gimmick, he act swiped directly from Sin Bodhi, man. He really did. And Sin Bodhi is pissed about it, too. But I'll tell you one thing about Sin Bodhi. He's the, ki- the king. He's the king of the promo videos, man. His promo videos are so fucking out there and crazy. <laughs> and it's really, it's really fun. How, I really how is have it- a good time working with him. How's the promos for you? I mean, is that is that another fun aspect of the gig? Like, I like doing shit. Like, it, you know, I talked to you tonight. I've got a couple promos already. <laughs> like, it's like I, I love doing them and all, but but you know, it's I've got so many things going on. It's hard to find time to set it up and do you know do it all. It's crazy. Like we're doing this thing, uh, thirty one days of fear, with our other show, the JP Dub, and it's just on like our Instagram and Facebook now, and then eventually we'll all be pieced together, but. 31 days, 31 horror movies, like recommendations. And we make oh, me between me, him, Shredden, and some guests, we make uh, one minute videos, one minute or less, like quick. You can make it as goofy, as creepy as you want, but you're just, you're, you're putting the movie over. You want someone to watch this fucking movie that day. And we have a lot of fun with it. And that kind of, it keeps you on your toes. Cause I always look at it. Like I got a fucking minute to cut this wrestling promo. 
you know, and sometimes I'll spew out a bunch of shit, but that's the great thing about editing and iMovie and shit. <laughs> like just put the best pieces together. I'll be at work. Like, Hey, I'm leaving in five minutes. Let me go back on the workbench and hammer on some shit and <laughs> spray some brake clean, make it look like I'm putting a fucking woman back together because I want you to watch Frankenhooker. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. the type of motherfucker I am. And that's the shit we do. Like, and so for me, like it, it almost feels like cutting a wrestling promo and I've done it. Uh, like I said, we're a big part of like Chicagoland wrestling scene. Uh, shot the Black Label Pro and Warrior Wrestling and Freelance and AAW and all those guys. Um, I've had to, you know, cut promos for them, you know, with like either like a short prediction for a match or just like, hey, hyping a show and shit like that. Like it's cool, but you can make it so quick. And I understand what you're saying. That's what this is like my point I'm getting at because like I hear you on the time of day, brother, you know, between two podcasts you know children a family full-time job and Bands. fucking a band you know where's my time and trying to you know trying to make everybody happy but myself i gotta find that time i ain't got no time yeah, yeah that's true and i'm i'm also working on a guar compilation book that's got all of the artwork i ever did for guar including all of the comics you know all of that shit and i'm recoloring a lot of the comics and stuff so it's taking a long time but it's uh once that comes out it's going to be super incredibly awesome so that's another thing on the horizon as well are you are you looking to do that like independent or are you trying to look for a company no i'm going to do it with in conjunction with guar so i'll probably use their publisher or whatever you know they've got better connections on that i just feel like and are they still on uh are they still on metal blade uh not really but metal blade still owns a lot of their shit you know they've slowly been buying it all back piece by piece but one of the things that metal blade owns all of is the fucking video yeah know, all of those videos so and i think that I, I sort of feel like if fans could see that more that it would really change the whole game you know yeah and i don't see like you guys that's what i'm saying man you got the notoriety the the rub, the recognition from 30 years of this crazy career and mad respect. I mean, you watch the fucking documentary and look at the people that are in it. Dude, you got fucking, uh, what's Alex Winter was in there fucking senior guys of praise. He just did a killer Zappa documentary. I don't know if you're in a Zappa or not. But, no, I haven't seen it. I'll have to try to find that. Yeah, dude. Um, And, and all these in like comedians and Weird Al, fucking Weird Al is in there. Like... Why wouldn't they like, hey, man, if I was an exec at like, like I said, any of these major Marvel or comic graphic novel companies, especially Image or uh, who's another one that does kind of off the wall stuff like ID Dark Horse, Dark Horse, Dark know, Horse like, did uh, Hell, yeah. Hellboy and shit. Oh, yeah. yeah and Dark all those put out some of our stuff. Yeah. They, a while back, they put out a few of our, a few of our things. Hell yeah. So, dude. The the wrestling gig, it's fucking here. You're doing it. You're what is this? I mean, you're gonna carry it out. How, do you have a glass ceiling for this shit? Is it depending on your body or what? Right now, it is completely dependent on my whether I can physically do it or not. I mean, you just mentioned you're 60 years old. Old, you know, yeah. not to date yourself because you know, AJ ain't nothing but a number. Even though I'm 40 and feel like <laughs> shit, <laughs> it's all down here. Well, we'll see. We'll see how long I can take it. You know, I'm I'm really super into it. You know, and I I'm always laughing to people about how you know how you know I'm, you know I'm, you know I'm, I'm a little man's body. You know, so uh, I, I'm gonna. My plan has always been to keep doing wrestling as long as I still physically can, and then just concentrate on my artwork. You know, but I know you so many cool projects I need to do. Uh, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> well you mentioned earlier so right now i'm sort of like earlier, go ahead go ahead you mentioned earlier too um you know if the opportunity came back to do some more shit with guar i mean there's hey man time heals all wounds and all that shit and you've already done it once and i know the reason i've been able to see the original fucking misfits three times is because danzig had the same you know he's like man look around bowie and all these other guys everybody prince oh, they're all fucking dying if we don't do it now we never will. I'll never see Jello with dead candies, unfortunately. I don't think, but I mean, is is that it's that's true, just, man? It's a weird thing. 
it is weird, man. When you I get older, the- you get that perspective, man. And it sucks because you're like, damn, I'm old, but damn, am I <laughs> fucking wise? <You> know? <laughs> That's what you get. As, like I, I was hanging out with Gore just last night talking about business stuff and all like that. And, and I was saying that I, if I can, if I can get to the point physically where I can do it, I'd like to do another cycle again, and, you know, maybe be on the album and, and tour, do a whole tour cycle. Yeah. You know? I mean, but a lot of it cool. is being able to physically do it, you know. Well, that's why the because wrestling training is going to get in, your ass in shape. Well, there's a big difference in doing a wrestling show every month or a couple of shows a month and then going and doing it night after night after night, you know. Oh, yeah. So you know, when you don't have enough time to heal up between shows, you know, or and like like all that stuff that's where it gets into the danger zone you know <laughs> and i'll tell you even when i was younger even when i was younger and all when i get on the stage i'm putting in, putting it all out to the point where when i get off stage i'm desperately gra- gasping for breath dude you know? brother even i am with you that's yep. part of the reason my body hurts like me and Bodie, we play underground grindcore we've been doing it for 20 years in in my 20s, when I first was afforded the opportunity and, and going back to something else you said earlier about Guar being that release from all the bullshit and tension, that's how it was for me. And especially mm-hmm. the music we play is fucking oh, yeah. psychotic. It's a good release. Technical. I'm fucking, it's all getting out on the stage and people will come up to me afterwards and I'm really quiet and reserved. I didn't really want to be around anybody or talk to them. It's like, man, you're totally different. I was like, well, yeah, I'm just, that's my demons. Yeah, I'm exercising, <laughs> right? you know? But That's flipping off, yeah, flipping off the stage when there's no stage, fighting your yep. band members like that was part of the show, you know, like people putting cigarettes out on you, <laughs> like kicking you, and no one catching me when I flipped off, and now my body's paying the fucking price, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, it's the truth. What's uh, uh, as we wind down here, what's um, musically? I mean, I know you're not you're not like a musician per se, but what's some of the shit that gets you going musically man just well, what's I a round always, table palette i was always into bowie a lot because uh i was really into the the theatricalness of it but then i would always uh i would buy his records and the first time i would listen to his records i would always go oh man this sucks what's he doing this time <laughs> but then it would grow on me you know, yeah. and I would start to understand what he's doing musically, and I would get into it. I also like uh, Ian Hunter from Martha Hoople. You know, he mm-hmm. split from them, and then he teamed up with Mick Bronson, who was the Spiders from Mars guitar player, mm-hmm. and they toured together for a while. And uh, that music really super gets me off big time. And I was always into like B fifty twos. I'm like a yes. real punk rocker dude, really. You know. And Guar really was a very much a punk rock band when it first started out. Well, let me and ask I you st- about one guy mm-hmm. in particular and shout out to my drummer, Brad Vanderzee, because he got me the best birthday gift ever was a GG Allen wrestling buddy. What's your take uh, on GG Allen? <laughs> well, you know, he was contemporary with us when we were first touring around. We would see uh, his name and Marilyn Manson always on the same page advertising our shows you know early manson was dope like lunchbox or portrait of american (laughs) family yeah and uh but people would like their super hard intense hardcore fans would go oh man you guys are all fake gg allen (laughs) you know and i would be like man look he can he can dive around on as much broken glass and rub feces all over himself as much (laughs) as he wants to you know personally i like the fake blood you know Right. And and the other thing about him too is that he used to always brag about how he was going to like uh commit suicide and take out a whole bunch of the sta- uh the audience too, you know. Yeah, then he just uh, died of an overdose and I was disappointed. Yeah, and then he just died of an overdose. But ah, whatever, dude. <laughs> uh, I just I, like musically, I mean, and there's the whole thing with Gigi and that's kind of like part of that music. question. Yeah, like the it's early shit with the jabbers, like, and he's playing drums on there, and it's fucking good, and it's like it's good punk. It's all decipherable, like bored to death, and uh, you hate me and I hate you, you know, like that shit fucking rules. What about like, um, I mean, we're talking eighties punk, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, any of those? Yeah, 
Yeah, all of those. And like uh, uh, the Dead Kennedys, for sure, we were in the Dead Kennedys. And Iggy Pop, especially. Yeah, the you know, Stooges, but, dude. That was always one of our big favorites. We played in the Slave Pit all the time while we were working. And there were a couple of other albums that might surprise you. Jesus Christ Superstar is one. We used to play that like one all the time. And another one we used to play all the time was the NWA uh, uh, Fuck the Police album. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love NWA. Dude, so I was just on my birthday. I was rocking the world's most <laughs> dangerous group, NWA t shirt. I'm a huge Easy E, Mark. You'll find out here shortly. Yeah, all that stuff is all that stuff is awesome. All that stuff is awesome. And uh, what about Zappa? I gotta know because I'm a diehard Zappa, and I brought him up earlier. Oh yeah, dude, that that live from the Fillmore East album. You know yeah. the one where they're talking, they're picking up the groupie. Oh yeah. my god, I never get tired of listening to that. I remember <laughs> when I was in high school, some uh, one of the a girl actually brought that album in, and was uh, and our art teacher used to let us play. Music sometimes, you know, if we were working on like a painting or something like that, the whole class was doing something. and so she would let us bring in records sometimes. And this girl brought in that Frank Zappa record, you know, and started playing it. And then they get to the part where they're going, uh, uh, talking about my dick is, you know, I'm one a dick, I'm one a dick, you know, and all that stuff. <laughs> and I'll, if his or, or, uh, we want to hook up with you if your dick is a monster, you know, and all this shit like that. And our teacher was like, oh, no, I'm taking this album off. Whoop, you know, yeah. but Dude. yeah, man, I love all that shit. I love all that shit. Yeah. He was another guy, another cat that was like really into like, that's why I like to ask. And I'm a huge Zappa Mark mainly, but I like to ask different, you know, guests I have that I think might have maybe had a little influence or just awareness of them because he was another huge like B movie guy, dude, and he he liked to make movies. And I think he who was that guy? It was like Cal Schenkel or something. I might be botching his name, botch. But uh, he was the guy that did all the uh, look at early Primus videos and Tool videos, right? You know, like the claymation the shit. stop motion. Uh -huh. Yeah, Zappa was doing that, and dude, it was oh my god, it was the sickest shit on earth. Like, I get really fucking stoned and watch this, and it's like a claymation Zappa, and he's playing this super intricate piece because it's fucking zappa and then all of a sudden his fingers just like turn into like 12 fingers on one hand it's like doo -doo 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 -doo, and the xylophone's <laughs> going note for note with it and i'm like holy shit but you know he was just another one of those super creative dudes like that I and mean, maybe he wasn't like the earth didn't deserve somebody like that you know yeah he did a lot of cool shit for sure but uh, brother, we got Lucha Vavoom coming up. Uh, I think it's two days, right? October twenty seventh and twenty eighth. It sure is. It Hell sure yeah. is. And either day you go, it's going to be equally awesome. That's right. And we're going to have tickets. Uh, well, not tickets, but links to tickets in the description, so you guys can click that. And uh, something else we're going to have links for is Hunter. All the shit you're doing doing right now. So if you want to pop your website where you can buy people can buy merch from you all that good shit now's the time to do it yeah check out houseofhuntar.com that's where all that stuff is i have uh posters t-shirts a couple of dvds you can get and uh stuff like that so stand up for the sick fun that you crave and support the arts you know hell yeah um dude once again thank you so much for fucking coming and talking with us man I would love to do it again sometime. I feel like there's so much more we can fucking rap about. So if you're down. Well, next time I have something really cool to talk about, I'll let you know. Awesome. <laughs> All right. <Yes. laughs> Brother, thank you. Thank everybody for watching and listening right now. If you're listening on any podcasting platform, make sure you rate and review and tell your motherfucking friends because it's the right thing to do on YouTube. Like, subscribe, fucking share. We're all over the socials. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, unfortunately, fucking TikTok. I don't uh, know why it fucking happens, you know? Because you love it. <laughs> I, I rarely I post love it. it. No one likes my videos of Deicide fucking playing live on there. I don't know why. I would. <laughs> but anyways, thank you guys. Because they want challenges. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they are challenged. The fan base is challenged. <laughs> Buy our shirts, prowrestlingtees.com forward slash JPWTs. Check them out. Those are sexy. Look at them go. Fucking sexy. They'll get you men, women, whatever you want, you know? Fucking buy them up. Until oh, yeah. next time. Peace.
the juice, this is the juice, Bruiser Pony, and Techno Motherfucking Destructor! Lucha Vavoom, October 27th, 28th, get tickets, check it out, wet them up, wet them up, wet them up. <laughs> So fucking wet for Hunter Jackson, Techno Destructo. Get on board, or you fucking pay the price of the penance, you bitches. Oh, yeah, yeah. You gonna do sex to me? Did you like that video? If so, be sure to hit like and subscribe and check out more killer content from your boys at Juice Pro Wrestling. Wow, yeah!